It's a two-bottle sermon there, I see. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to know we have so many new life men and women standing at the guard, amen, serving this great country. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, fathers, grandfathers, some of you great-grandfathers, some of you just adopted fathers of a whole neighborhood. That happens so many times. Yeah, and mothers that had to be fathers. I've got one here today. My mom's here. Wave at him, Mom. <laughs> she had to be dad and mom. My dad lived a very troubled life, and it was no excuse or no reason, but about three days before Father's Day one year, he took his own life. And uh, I hadn't thought about it for quite a few years, but this year it's been 45 years since he took his life. I'm getting old. That's all there is to it. Older, I should say. I'm trying not to get old. But uh, I'm grateful my mom did serve as mom and dad, and she never let me use any of that as an excuse for bad behavior and bad living, and I am so grateful to her for that. And all you other moms that are mom and dad, too. I often tell young ladies, single moms in particular, because a lot of times you just feel like you can't make another step and you can't do it. I said, my mom did it and did it with seven. You can get her done. Amen. By the grace of God. Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word? We're going to take just a little deviation from the book of Numbers this morning. Well, we'll pick up next week again. But I want you to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. We're going to look at together. Ladies, I gave you a spiritual checkup on Mother's Day. And I told you, I said, hold on, the guy's turn is coming, and it's here today. Fathers, we love you. God loves you. He wants you to be mighty men of God. Amen? And so we're going to do a little spiritual checkup here this morning. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, I'm reading from the New American Standard this morning. He said, be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. And let all that you do be done in love, men. Would you bow your heads and let us go to the Father of us all. Heavenly Father, there is one God, one Lord, and one Father of us all. And Lord God, we just come before you this morning to thank you for the fathers in our lives and for the father figures in our lives. Father, in them, you choose if they are willing to manifest yourself, your love, your glory. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would touch every one of us, every man and every father figure in this place. And Father, help us to rise through your word to a new level of manhood, to a new level of serving you, to a new level of being workers and laborers together in the work of your kingdom. Father, transform us, renew us, and regenerate us in the likeness of the greatest man that ever walked the face of this planet, your Son, our Savior, and our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Act like men, Paul said. Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. You know, a lot of men have the idea that somehow church and faith is a woman thing. But God says, act like men. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that strength comes from that very line that says, let all that you do be done in love. Today we're celebrating Father's Day. It is a day to honor our dads, our granddads, our father figures in our lives. I'm grateful to God, though I had no earthly father, I did have my mom, but there are also other men in the community, some of them Christians, some of them not, but there were men who had stepped up in my life, whether they were ball team leaders or teachers or just a, a dad of a, a friend that I had at school, there were many 
many faithful men that took some interest in directing my life and trying to help me get on the path sometimes when, when things were wrong. And never take those folks for granted either. Amen? I thank God for a grandfather. Um, I didn't realize it while he was alive. He has passed on. I didn't realize it while he was alive. I couldn't even tell how much influence he had in my life. I only actually lived in his home for a little while, and that was after I got out of school. But uh, I find myself sitting around doing the same mannerisms, liking the same food. And uh, I just, I looked at my wife one day and I said, I'm Pop. And I didn't realize it. I didn't realize the influence he had had on my life. Fathers, you have great influence, not only on the lives of the children in your own home, but on the community, on all of the people that are around you, that you interact with every day. What an awesome thing it is <laughs> to be a man, truly. But to be a man after God's own heart is the goal of the Christian life. And we need to honor and love our dads, our granddads, our father figures. I wasn't a Christian when my dad passed away. I wasn't a Christian when my, both of my grandfathers passed away. I didn't get to tell them how much I loved and appreciated them because it wasn't until I got a little older that I started walking with God and had enough sense to look around and see what was going on in my life and really realize what a gift these individuals were in my life. And no father is perfect. Some fathers are worse than perfect. Mine was worse than perfect, I assure you. But the other thing I'm grateful for to my mom is she never taught me to hate him or to dislike him. You know, even when he died and I was a teenager, I didn't have to stand at a coffin with all the guilt and all the worry of, you know, of some broken relationship that I didn't have. He didn't have much of a relationship with me, but through the direction of my mother and others that were around me, I still had a relationship with him. And we need to realize just how awesome these people are. If you grew up without a dad, Psalm 27 verse 10 says this, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I've shared with you as a congregation many times that, you know, there are things that you grieve when you don't have a father growing up. But again, as I've gotten older and I've been able to look back, most of the time you really can't see mercy and grace until you turn around and look back. We don't always see it when it's happening to us. But I could look back in my life and see, even in those times when, when my earthly father was not there, my heavenly father was. Even before I acknowledged him, even before I loved him and served him, he was there over and over and over again. In Ephesians 6, verse 2, it says, Honor your father and your mother, because this is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it, namely, so you will live well and have a long life. You need to honor your father and your mother. God says, I promise you that if you do that, I promise you that with that obedience, you'll have a long life. I often look at it and say, yeah, because your parents won't kill you before you grow up. Someone wisely said, grandchildren is the reward of not killing your own children while they're growing up. Amen. <laughs> but we need to honor our father and our mother. Being a father is a great honor in itself because it comes with so much authority, it comes with so much influence, and it comes with so much power. You have the ability, Dad, to change the world. You have the ability to form the lives of your children into that which God wants it to be. Also with all of that, though, comes great responsibility and accountability. I was talking with someone this past week and their heart is on fire for the Lord and they, they, wanted, they want to be a witness. They want to go out and, you know, just on the street, knock on doors. I mean, they are so passionate about God. They said, I really want to do that, but they said, my wife just isn't on board. They said, what do you think about that? I said, well, let me tell you this. I want to leave you with this little word of wisdom. I said, you need to pray and ask God to touch her heart. But I said, you need to make sure that you don't move without her and that you take her with you 
Because I said, it won't be any good. You can go out here and win a thousand people to God, but if you show up in front of Jesus one day and she's not with you, it isn't going to amount to much. Husbands, the Bible said, love your wives. One of the responsibilities that you have, husband, is to make sure that as you walk side by side with her through this earthly life, that if nobody else on this planet shows her who Jesus Christ is, you do. If you never get to evangelize another person or another state or another country, you make sure you evangelize your spouse and you do it not just with words, but you do it with the example of your life. And as Paul said, let it all be done in love. I married a beautiful young couple yesterday in a beautiful setting. And I shared with them at the end of the service. I said, I want to give you a word of encouragement concerning marriage. Never take each other for granted. All the responsibilities of marriage and life are going to hit you very soon. And it is so easy when all of those responsibilities and obligations come to start neglecting the one that you love the most because they're the easiest to walk over. I said, but don't ever let that happen. Don't ever let that happen. Fathers, husbands, our spouses are the first person that God's going to call us into account for when we stand before him and say, what have you done to share Christ with them? Fathers are called to be the high priest of the home. You like my picture up here? A lot of you probably haven't been able to see it real good. I picked this up at a yard sale probably 20 years ago for a little bit of nothing. It's a Norman Rockwell copy of a print. Dad's sitting in the chair, smoking a cigarette, reading the Sunday paper. Look who's going to church. Did you notice these little horns here? <laughs> I said, I got to have that picture. I'm going to put that on my office wall. That's a picture that Norman Rockwell of what he envisioned in his heart, what most men do with their spiritual lives. Somehow we think that it's the wife's responsibility to train the kids and to get everybody to church, and we'll just chug, chug, chug along in the background. But that has never been God's will or God's plan. As a father, as a husband, as a parent, you've been called to be the high priest of your home. You're the pastor of your congregation. Ephesians 5, 17 so then said, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, because not only are you going to be accountable for your wife, you're going to be accountable for your children as well. It says, do not get drunk with wine. You say, oh, I have a little once in a while with the meal. Well, just make sure your children, if you're going to do that, make sure they can handle it at the same level. For that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Sir, you're to be supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit filled with the presence of God, a song in your heart, joy in your life, showing Christ to your whole family. You're not called to be the bear that everybody's afraid of and watches the clock to see when they're coming home and when they come in because the whole world's got to change because the bear is coming in the door. <laughs> Let God change you. Let God mold you into the image of his son. And it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, verse 21. It says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Most of the time when I read that to men, they're like, glory to God, I'm the leader, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I'm the CEO, I'm Tarzan, Eugene. And that's not what God means at all. Jesus said, in the kingdom, the authority that you exercise is different from the authority of the world. The authority of the world says, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, and you listen to everything I say. The authority of the kingdom of God says, God has made me the head. I am now your servant leader. I am to love you. I am to cherish you. I am to help meet every need of your life. I am to help run the business of our family, if you will. And I'm in charge, and if it isn't running well, it is my fault. God lays it at my doorstep. 
because I'm the one in charge to serve and to love. See, God says the husband is the head of the home, but he also goes on to say this, husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. There is not a woman alive, I can assure you, well, I shouldn't say that. Some of them have been so messed up and screwed up by the, the logic and philosophy of women's lib that you might not be able to get them to see it and understand it anymore. But I started to say there's not a woman alive that if you love her like Jesus, treat her like Jesus would, serve her like Jesus would, that would have any problem following your leadership at all. <laughs> And that's what God calls us to. He calls us to be Jesus to our families. To do unto them as we would have them do unto us. And to do it first because we're the head. We're the leader. We are the one to set the example. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, I would, Pastor, but she's gone. Well, how did you love her when she was there? Again, there's a few floozies out there. But you know what? Most women really crave someone to love them and to care for them and to nurture them and to help them to be secure. Women usually don't run unless they got a really, really powerful reason to run. What I'm saying is, man, don't be the reason. Don't be the reason they run. Be the reason that they never want to let go of you because they're going to have a hard time finding somebody else to treat them like you treat them because you treat them like Jesus Christ would treat them. Amen. <laughs> he says, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. This word will clean us up, men. It will change us. It will mold us into the image of Jesus Christ. And if we let God do that in us, he will use us to do that with our wives, to change them, to mold them, to help them be what God called them to be as we live and walk together and become one. God says he wants us to do that, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You know, you can't be cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word unless you get in the Word and let the Word get in you. Oh, pastor, I'm not that good a reader. I never really read that much. You know why you're not a good reader? Because you never read that much. I'm a genius, aren't I? <laughs> Learning to read it's like learning to ride a bicycle. The less you do it, the less you're going to be able to do it. And the more you do it, the more you're going to be able to do it. But you need to read this Word. You need to get it down in your heart and life. And if you're not a real good reader, that, that's, a, that's a really good reason to come to church every time the doors are open instead of going to some other goofy place. If you can't read, let somebody else preach it to you. But get it down in your heart. Get it down in your life. And let God change you so that it will change your family. Church, it's so easy for us to holler at the world and talk about, you know, the media and talk about what society's doing. If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing at home, we have no finger to point at lost people who are living in darkness and walking in darkness. Do you know you have the greatest opportunity to transform and to change the lives of your children and your spouses than any other thing in this earth? Even your pastor cannot have the effect that you will have on your family if you will walk with God. It says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Remember what I told you on Mother's Day? If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So if you learn to love her and take care of her, it's like loving you and taking care of yourself. You keep mama happy, Happy wife, happy life. Not rocket science, but you got to do it. It says, for no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference, rather, Paul says, to Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives. Verse 33 said, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as he loves himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And I put at the end of that line, man up. Man up. Be the type of man that your wife and your children can look up to and honor and respect and know that you are a leader that is worth following in life. And single people, don't marry unsaved people. The Bible tells you not to do that. If you marry an empty parking lot thinking somehow God's going to transform and change all that, and then it doesn't, then don't blame God. (laughs) You say, well, there aren't many men out there like that, Pastor Ken. Yeah, but if you'll be the person that you're supposed to be, God will make sure you find one. Fathers are to lead in training the children. Did you know that, Dad? You're to lead in it. Oh, I'll go to work and I'll, I'll bring home the bacon and I'll pay the bills. You, you take care of the kids. Said Jesus, never, ever, <laughs> ever. It takes two. Ephesians 6, 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God at this point is speaking to a child that's old enough to understand this instruction. (laughs) But before that, guess what, Dad? You are to learn how to train your children in the Lord. You're to learn how to do it, and you're to learn how to make it happen. One of the worst things I hate to hear in life is some parent whining about how bad their child is. If he, if he or she is, hold on. Smile. I don't want to split your lip. It's your fault. It's your fault. The Bible doesn't say raise them. You raise tomatoes and potatoes. You don't raise kids. You train kids. Your kids will be exactly what you train them to be or by default what you don't train them to be. And you know what our kids are most of the time, the little ones? They're you without the maturity to hide it in public. If you knew how teachers and Sunday school teachers and even pastors and people in public could see into your home through your children, you'd hide them. If you are training a child and that child is not behaving the way it's supposed to, you didn't get it trained. That's the problem. I don't have time today. It's not rocket science. The Bible has just a few things. I don't know how many of them I have over here. I have a book over here called Biblical Child Training. It's everything you need to know. Dr. Spock didn't write it. James Dobson didn't write it. I love James Dobson, but if you're going to raise kids the way he tells you, all you can do is raise kids. You can't do anything else. But the Bible has a way for you to raise your children and train your, I'm saying raise, train, train your children. And you can, you can do it. Now, if you didn't get trained, and a lot of you didn't, because that's, that's my job security. God's plan in life is that you'd have godly parents that would raise you in a godly way so that when you became an adult, you'd already be a disciple of Christ. But because a lot of them don't, I have a job. Now I have to try to do it when you're 30 plus. And it's harder. It's easier to train them when they're like this. Don't let them smack you around, lead you around, run the family. I've seen kids this high that run their entire family. You know, you tell them to do something, they run up and smack you. If you don't learn to do something about that when they're this big, guess what's going to happen when they're a teenager? You say, oh my God, I took them to church. They were in Sunday school and they're hellions. What happened? You didn't train them. You didn't train them. (laughs) 
But if you didn't get trained, guess what? And you find yourself a teenager or an adult and you're not trained, it's time for you to train yourself and let Jesus help you do it. I was 22 when I got saved. I was a brat. And that's saying it nicely. It took Jesus Christ to help me to grow up as an individual. But God's counting on you to do that for your kids now. And dads, guess what? You are a part of that. You are the leader, the authority of your household. Now learn how to do it in a biblical way so that you don't abuse and misuse your kids. Because this is what the Bible says. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger and bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know how you fathers frustrate your children to anger even when you're trying to train them? You change the rules on them all the time. You know, when they're at home and they're being bad and they're doing everything they're not supposed to do, but you're busy watching your favorite television program so you could care less? You just train them that whatever behavior they're doing is fine. But now you get them out in public somewhere and you still don't really care about the child much, but you're embarrassed to death that they're acting that way, and now you're going to bring the hammer down on them. And they're going to look at you like you're nuts. And they're going to say, why was it okay over there, but it's not okay over here? It takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of consistency to train children. You can't just train them when you're in a good mood, and when you're rested, and when you feel like it, and let them go all the other times, and then try to train them in every situation that you think they ought to be trained. When I see a kid going berserk in, in the grocery store or Walmart or somewhere, you know what that tells me about the parent? Even when those parents are trying to deal with that kid there, it tells me they're doing nothing at home. It tells me the only reason they're doing it there is because they're embarrassed now because everybody else is seeing what they're not doing at home. So they're going to act like they're a parent for a little while. And those kids get angry. Why? Because it's unfair. What if you went out to the end of the road here at the stop sign and there was a state policeman sitting at the end of the road and 20 Sundays he just let you breeze right through that stop sign? Didn't say a word to you. But finally, one Sunday you go through there, he pulls you over, puts handcuffs on you, and said, you're getting 20 years, bud. Why? You ran the stop sign. Is that going to be fair? But see, that's what we do to our kids a lot of times. Because we're just not consistent. We're just not consistent. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Learn how to discipline them in the right way, in the right manner, the way the Bible would teach you to do it. And you can learn to do it. I've had hundreds of parents, if not thousands, over my 39 years of preaching and teaching the Word of God. They'll say, Pastor Ken, we just can't do anything with them. I want to ask you something. Have you ever seen a Mennonite kid act up in a grocery store? <laughs> it's pot. Well, they, they don't have my little booger. Oh, I know. They're a little booger because you let them be a little booger. I gotta quit using that word, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Little schnot. Listen to what Job says. Chapter one. <laughs> That's not any better, is it, reason? <laughs> this is something else you need to do, fathers. This Job, it says this about Job. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One of the things I can tell you about child training is it needs to be bathed and soaked in prayer. Do you pray for your kids? Do you pray for wisdom and direction? Do you pray safety and protection over them? Do you pray that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be formed in their hearts and in their lives? The Bible says in Acts that we can be saved. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be saved in our household. If we'll live and walk in God and pray for our kids and, and live like we're supposed to. You know, you can be a dad and be the greatest hindrance to your children coming to Christ that ever walked the earth. 
God wants you to do the exact opposite. I posted on Facebook this morning after I got to church. I said, Happy Father's Day. Some of you probably read it already. I said, but fathers, know this. You can give them every rich, every blessing that this world has to offer. But if you don't lead them by example and lead them to Christ and lead them to eternal life, you have failed them in the worst kind of way. In Titus 2, verse 7, it says, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Men, man up. Do what that says. It'll change your life. It'll change your eternity. It'll change the life of your spouse. It'll change the life of your kids. It will change the direction of your family. It is so easy. You all look so good this morning. You really do. I mean, all of our hair is in place, and we got all the right clothes on, and I mean, we're, you know, you got it going on. But do you look like that spiritually outside of here? You know, we all look holy in here, like, Butter wouldn't melt in our mouths. <laughs> Live like that every moment of every hour. Don't be the one that condemns your sons and your daughters to an eternity without God because you play the hypocrite outside of church. Your kids know you. Your kids see you. Your family knows what you really are. They see who we really are, not just what we talk about and what we say. People are scared to death of how their kids are going to turn out. I can tell you exactly how they're going to turn out. They're going to turn out just like you. They're going to dress like you. They're going to act like you. They'll even have the same gait and walk as you. They will. They'll pay their bills like you do. They'll take care of their possessions like you do. They'll come to church like you do. Or don't. Hello? Hello? They will be just like you, even when they don't want to be. There's not a teenager alive that doesn't say at some point in their heart, I will never be like her. I will never be like him. I got news for you. You can't escape it. You're so much like them, you don't even know parts of you are like them. You can't even see it anymore. You know what the upside of that is? Be what God called you to be, because they will be like that too. They truly will. And fathers, you're to provide for your families. I put this on here last because I didn't want you to think this was all you had to do. You know, a lot of men just think, man, I just, I'll work, I'll bring home the bacon, I'll come home, I'll take the work boots off, I'll sit down, I'll let her run the rest of the show. Take care of the kids, take care of the house, take care of the family, take care of the bills. I'm bringing home the bacon. You are the bacon if you think that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Some fathers don't bring home the bacon. If you physically cannot work, thank God we live in the country that we do. Thank God we pay the taxes that we do. I don't have a problem, and you as a Christian shouldn't have a problem helping anybody that's in a position where they can't help themselves. But man, if you can work and you don't, you know what the Bible says? You shouldn't eat. I'll tell you something about your kids too. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. All they want to do is lay around the house. They're 20 years old and still living with mom, and I've got to pay all their bills. Quit feeding them. Oh, well, they'll die. No, they won't. Hunger is a great motivator, I can tell you personally. <laughs> and whether you're dad or mom, for God's sake, little Johnny or Susie, grow up. Don't keep them a baby their whole lives unless you're going to keep them 
as a baby their whole lives. And, and I got to tell you, even the ugly ones are cute when they're this big. Oh, you know some of them are ugly. You thought it and I thought it too. Let's be honest. God already knows. I know we've had all of our psychology. Nobody's ugly. You've looked at babies and the mom's going, oh, isn't they beautiful? And you're like, inside you're like, I'm glad it's got two eyes. But you know, it doesn't matter whether they're cute or they're ugly. When they're still acting like that, there's our youngest father. Stand up again, Kenny. Little, little Moo Ball Kenny Jr. is with us this morning. Just came into the world this week. <laughs> you can sit down, Dad. All right. <laughs> but you know what? It doesn't matter how cute they are when they're this big. When they're still babies and they're this big, nobody thinks they're cute. Nobody. Oh, they're my baby. Let them grow up. Teach them how to grow up. If you're smart, you'll teach them how to leave home and not come back. <laughs> Except to visit. Shortly. And then go again. <laughs> Dads, if we are physically able to, we are to be the providers of our home and to contribute to the provision of our home. In 2 Thessalonians 3, it said, while, you, while we were with you, we gave you the order, whoever doesn't want to work shouldn't be allowed to eat. That's the Bible. Don't throw rocks at me, man. That's the Bible. Whoever doesn't work shouldn't be allowed to eat. And I told you, we, we have a mandate from Christ to help those that cannot help themselves. The church should always do that. But man, if you can work, you're supposed to work. I met a fellow this past week. He's probably, oh, I don't know, maybe in his 60s. He was in my car and we're talking. He said, I'm really down and out. I said, where, where are you living? He said, I'm living on the street. I said, where are you going? He said, I need a ride over here. And I, I gave him a ride. On the ride, he said, we passed Walmart over here. He said, me and them kids that work at Walmart, they got to stand up all day. All day. We passed somewhere else, and he said, thought about doing that work one time. He said, man, that's a lot of hours. I didn't say it to him because I didn't know him from Adam. But I thought, I know why you're living on the street. He living on the street, talked about any job he could think about, but wasn't a job he was going to do. We Americans get mad when foreigners come into our country. When they come in illegally, you ought to get mad. But you know, there are a lot of foreigners that come into this country legally with nothing. And they end up with a house five times bigger than yours and a job better than yours. And they're driving BMWs and they're driving Lincoln Continentals and Jaguars. And you're standing on the corner going. <laughs> but you know why a lot of them are? They came here from countries where they could work their whole life, work a whole week and make a few dollars. They find out if I come to America and I work like I did for nothing there, and if I can get my kids to work, your kids won't mow the grass. You got teenagers at your house and you're still mowing your own grass. Shame on you. I don't feel sorry for you at all, you dummy. But they'll come and they'll say, you know what, son and daughter, if we all go to work, we can go to college. If we go to college, we can get degrees. And if we get degrees, we can get good jobs. And if we get good jobs, we can buy big houses and we can buy cars. And they do it and you're jealous. They'll work two or three different jobs. I love it when I go into McDonald's. I, I talk to everybody. You know that. But I, I'll talk to them at the counter. And I love it when a young person says to me, you know, I'm getting off in two hours. What are you doing in two hours? Going to my second job. 
God bless you. God bless you. Because see, nobody owes any of us anything. Anything that we didn't earn, nobody owes us. Nobody. I got a conversation with somebody this week about health care. They said the government needs to give us. I said, hold on a minute. Give who? Give what? They said, well, well you know, other countries got better health care and they need, this, this government ought to give us all universal health care. I said, why? They said, because them pharmacy people and them doctors are getting rich and half of us can't afford to go to the doctor. You know what I told them? I said, man, I'm with you. I said, let's have universal car dealers too. They said, what? I said, well, there's car salesmen out there. Man, they're they're selling cars for more than they're worth and they're making all kind of money. Let's fix that too. Let's get universal car dealers. They said, hmm. (laughs) I said, yeah, think about that a little bit. (laughs) Work. You know, the Bible says, in all labor, there's profit. I'll give you something even better. Jesus said, work like you're working for me, no matter what job you're doing, because the workman is worthy of his hire. I was at McDonald's this morning. I go to McDonald's a lot. It's like, a, you know, <laughs> I like McDonald's. You lie about it. It's like Walmart. Everybody, I hate Walmart. Yeah, but you go. I hate McDonald's. Yeah, but you're there too. There were two people in front of Carl and I this morning. McDonald's was almost completely empty, and it took this one girl, bless her heart, about 10 minutes to take this order. And I looked at my wife. I said, I'm glad it ain't busy this morning because we were on our way to church. And they want $15 an hour to do that. And I'm not against anybody getting ahead in life, but work, work. Work, and when you work, work like you're working for the Lord. And God will take care of you. He will bless what you're doing. He will help you provide. Paul said, we hear that some of you are not living disciplined lives. Oh, yeah, check that out. True that. You're not working, so you go around interfering in other people's lives. Idle hands are what? The devil's workshop. Work is redemptive by nature. Men, you need to work. If you're physically able to work, you need to go work. I can't find a job. That's strange. There's wanted posters everywhere I go. (laughs) I'm not talking about the ones at the post office. I'm talking about the ones we need to hire. Oh, but I can't go to work there. They don't pay enough. Well, then go to two of them until you get to the place that you can. And I can tell you another little insider. Go there and be a good employee, man. You can move through the ranks fast because there's not that many of them out there. Lady talked to me at McDonald's this week. She says, I'm training some new ones here. I said, how's it going? She said, two of them showed up, worked for three hours and left. (laughs) I said, not going so good, huh? She said, we can't find anybody to work here. Come to Spring Mills McDonald's if you need a job. I mean, to start, you don't have to make a career out of it, lifetime, but to start, but work for the Lord. He said, we order and encourage such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to pay attention to their own work so they can support themselves. The goal in life, men, is to work till you can support yourself and your family. In fact, I'm going to say something. I'll probably get in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyhow. You know me. Don't get married and leave home until you can get married and leave home. I told you I'm a genius. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and not come back. Now I know there, there's, there's things that happen. But don't start out that way. All right. You got to love me to get to heaven. Don't forget. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we can't allow ourselves to get tired of doing what's right. That's what Paul says. He's saying, man, man up. Man up. Be a man. 
for God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the platform if you would. I'm going to ask all you men and fathers that want to go to another level in your life in the Lord, I want you to stand up and walk up and stand up here. I want to pray for you. Right now, get up. Get out of your seat. Move. Get up here. Men. Come on, guys. Come on up. Don't be shy. Get up here. Get close. Dang, I'm glad to see all you up here. I thought my whole church was women on Mother's Day. I ain't kidding you. <laughs> oh, you are going to sing. My cousin says, just don't ask us to sing. You are going to sing before we're done. I'm, you're going to sing right here just like the ladies did. And you're going to man up. You're going to sing better, right? Okay, you're going to try. All right, I want you to bow your heads with me. We're going Lord in prayer, and I don't want you to run off. You are going to stay up here and sing when we're done. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, and we thank you most of all for your love, for your heart, for your direction to our lives. And Father, every man that's standing here this morning, Lord God, is a child that you created in your image, and in your likeness. Father, they have the potential to change their families, to change their spouse, to change their world, Father. And God, I thank you that they are in the house of God this morning. That, Lord, they love you and they are seeking your face. Father, I pray and I ask that you take the word that I shared this morning and, Father, that you would minister it to their hearts and write it on the tables of their hearts. Father, give them grace and strength. Lord, as you've spoken to them and there's areas that they need to bring closer and to a deeper level in you, Father, give them the wisdom to do it. Give them the grace to do it. You put them in charge. They are the CEOs of their households. And Father, most of them, if not all of them, have a spouse, they have children, Lord God, that they need to be the pastor, the leader, the shepherd. They need to be the high priest of their home. Draw their hearts to your word. Put a fire down inside of them to hunger and to thirst after you and give them grace and strength to apply the word to their lives. Help them, Father, to be patient with themselves and those around them and let your spirit work in them, Father, to change them and transform them and help them to be all that you created them to be in you. Father, we believe in the power of prayer, and you said that, Lord, where two or three would agree is touching anything according to your will, and Father, this is according to your will. Amen. You said we have now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Father's Day that we can celebrate. We thank you for our fathers, our spiritual fathers. All those who have blessed us with all their wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord God. Father, I speak over every man in this room today, Lord God. Father, that you would anoint them and raise them up and help them to be the man that they need to be, Lord God. No, Lord, don't pass me by either, Lord God. Help me. And Father, I speak over your people now. Father, make them the head and not the tail. Bless them as they come in and bless them as they go out. Prosper them in all that they do, Lord. Father, let there be great signs, wonders, and miracles. Follow them all the days of their life, Lord God. Father, I speak divine health over every person in this room, Lord God. Father, anoint these fathers and anoint these men for your glory and for your honor. Father, protect everybody as they go their own way, Lord. Father, I pray for divine appointments this week, Lord God. Father, that you'll meet with the men and the women and the children and everybody, Lord, in the sound of my voice, that they would hear your voice and be obedient to it this week, Lord God. Bless them now as they go their way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Happy Father's Day.